Hello, I am Russell B. Hill, and I'm your host today of WTF, and that is what the Fixed Ops. I'm also co-founder and managing partner of Fixed Ops Marketing. I'm also joined today by. I'm Charity Dunning. I am the co-host here at What the Fix Stops. And before I introduce our guest, I just got to give a shout out to Wins. I know our guest is familiar with this sponsor of ours. So people who love cars love Wins. Check them out. There's a link in the description below. Um, And I'd like to introduce our guest today. We have Chris McPhillips the VP of Fixed Ops at Sutherland Automotive. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. So introduce yourself to our audience. Tell us a little bit about you. Wow. So uh, my name is Chris McPhillips. Um, I've been automotive since I was 15. Um, Anywhere from uh, washing cars to filing paperwork to coding warranty claims, uh, I've sold cars, I've been a finance writer, finance director, service advisor, service manager, service director, and a uh, fixed ops director for multiple rooftops throughout my career. And uh, here I am now as the VP of um, Sullivan Automotive, um, working under uh, Mike Spinazzi. Well, congratulations. It is a phenomenal role. I think you've been there a, a year now or a little bit over a year? Close to a year, almost a year. Almost a year. Okay. It's unusual that we get a guest on like this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, I already regurgitated just a minute ago, but I feel it's compelled and very important to let all of you know how I met Chris because everything's about relationships. Everything we do is about relationships. So our company wasn't very old and he was, he was a fixed ops director at Route 66 Nissan. I believe it is AMSI store, Terry Taylor store. Yeah. So the four for one with Mike Pinaccio. Yep. Okay, that's it. So anyway, it was a, a cold call because I love just stopping in a dealer, saying hi, introducing myself, et cetera. And, and this guy was gracious enough to visit with me and another guy named Brandon Orlando, great guy. He liked what he saw and then realized that uh, they already signed up with another company a, a day or a couple of days before, et cetera. So no, no harm, no foul. Just thought I'd stay in touch with it. I think we may have communicated once or twice or something or maybe Brandon did. And then he disappeared. Well, I don't know the time frame. It's about a year, year and a half, something like that. And uh, we get an incoming lead at Fixed Ops Marketing, and they were fixing to sign up with, with another company. And I, if if I remember, Chris, you please interject. But I think it was the general manager or somebody said, "Hey, uh, before we do that, let's look at what the number one s- Nissan store and Fixed Operations is doing. Let's see what they're doing and who they're using." And of course, it was us. Thank you very much. So Chris reached out and we, we realized where we actually knew each other from. So we, I had taken, the store I was at, I had taken it to like number three in the nation, right? So we'd grown the store, we were ranked number three out of like a thousand, fix, thousand fifty six Nissan stores. So I was like, who's number one and how are they beating me and what are they doing? So it was Michael Barrick's store in Tennessee. Yeah. And then so I went to his website and I'm like, you know, if you're, if you want to be the best, you got to see what the best is doing and replicate that. So then I was like, oh my goodness, look at his website. I was like, oh, I've seen this before. And then that's when I sent the lead in. And then so, was, you know, we went down memory lane, how we had met before and, you know, we were ready to get signed up. So um, now we have your tool in all of our stores and just the amazement from the staff and even the managers like, this existed? This is, you know, I didn't even know this was possible. They're so amazed at the technology of and how many leads generate from our website. My son's also in the car business. Uh, you know, he's only worked at one store. It's a Ford store called Bill Letter Ford. Been there seven and a half years now. And I was talking to the fixed ops director, stopped in. He'd just gotten back from a, uh, what, uh, is it NEC? Is that the name? They, they do Focus 20 groups? NCM. Like NCM. Yeah. Thank you very much for the correction. So he, was, he, he saw me. I stopped in to say hi to him. Occasionally, he, in, in, uh, he said, come, come, come on in, come on in. He was on the phone with somebody. And I sat down. He said, man, I got to tell you what just happened. And so I said, well, what's that, Dave? He said, well, I've, three days I've been at this NCM 20 group for our Ford dealers. And we were talking. And he said, listen, I, um, 
they had this thing, this website grader, and uh, they graded our website and we got an F. Do you believe that? And I said, absolutely. It's horrible. Anyway, <laughs> he laughed uh, because I could do that with him. And he said, uh, let me tell you something else that happened. They pulled up, it was a Nissan store, the number one that they thought was the go-to of where everybody needed to be looking to go to with service parts and accessories on their website. And I said, well, who was it? Who was it? He said, I don't know. It's in my notes. Uh, hold on a second. So he powered up his laptop, you know, and I said, you don't have to do No, no, no. I, I, now, now I got to. So he said, he said, Hudson Nissan, Nissan of North Charleston. And oh, I said, that's, that's my store. Yeah. That's my store. That's where Chris was at. Anyway, I thought that was really cool that NCM is using your own store's website is like, <laughs> hey, this is like a benchmark where you need. Is that, I get goosebumps. Do you have goosebumps too? Or is it just, it's probably just me. I don't know. No, that's wild. I wanted to ask you, and you mentioned a little bit at the beginning, but I've, I was kind of looking through some of your posts and things and you like maybe month after month reach some of these top level ranks at at your dealership or maybe your whole group. And I wanted to ask you to elaborate, like what are some of the most recent ones? Um, what are you most proud of in the last six months? Well, so yeah, so um, I guess the stores have been um, performing extremely well. It's all, it's, it's the buy-in of how we're going to go about um, treating the guests at reception. Um, so we have a, service menus that have been created. Um, it's all built around giving guests many options on how to service their car. So we have different ways you can service your car. We have a, you know some smaller price packages and then some premium packages. We have Sunbit. So we just make it very easy to service your car and let them kind of choose instead of forcing a guest in like one price. So the more options, the more ways to pay, it just seems like it works really, really well for us. So we've had stores that have increased just in CP over last year, like over a hundred thousand dollars in gross. Wow. It's been, it's been wild. So That's some crazy. months our group will be up over a half a million dollars in CP gross over the last year. When you left um, Hudson to take that opportunity, I remember us talking about it. You were um, at first you were a little apprehensive and you dived right in. It was probably a train wreck. And one thing I know about Chris, I want you to elaborate a little bit on this too. Chris is not a guy that sits in the office and looks at reports and, you know, leads, or as you say, manages. Okay. Uh, Chris is a leader. He's not, he, he's not a, um, a manager. Yeah. You can, anybody can light a fire and somebody get it moving, but Chris lights a fire inside of people. Okay. Finding out what they want, building relationships with them. Do I got that right? You're not an office person. You're actually in these stores almost every single day. And they're spread out. I think there's 12 or 13 of them. They're spread out all over the place. Is that right? Yeah. When, I, when, I'm, when I'm at a store, I'm in the service drive. I mean, talking to the guests, talking to the advisors. I love the guest story. And like, so, sometimes they're so passionate about the brand. Um, you know, like I was just in Toyota last week and this lady had already retired from Krispy Kreme and she was telling how she was the top sales associate at Krispy Kreme. And now she's at Dilliards and she's the top, you know, credit card sales associate at Dilliards. And it's like, oh, wow, there's all these things in your career is sales. And yet you choose to come to the dealer to get your car service. She's like, well, of course. So it's, it's just very interesting to, I know, right? <laughs> right. So I guess, you know, that's where she's going to get the best service. So I, that's what I try to coach the team members is the guests are choosing to come to the dealer for an experience, not just for like something average where they could get anywhere. You know, they want to have the opportunity to be, this is a soul, but educated on how to service the car. So um, I spend lots of time, um, but our Fort Myers store, I stand literally in the service drive for eight hours with my laptop working. So I wow. see every single car that flows to the dealership. That's unusual for, the, the vice presidents or directors of automotive groups, you know, for fixed operations. I think that's one thing that separates you, which is another of the many reasons uh, that we wanted to, to have you on the show. Plus I've developed a relationship with you over the years. I know we don't talk that much, but I'd like to believe that you're well taken care of with our performance team and particularly Leanne. Leanne loves you to death. And I know you love Leanne too, right? Yeah. The, uh, 
it's the minute we can like change it with Leanne or it's like moments, you know, I ask, Hey, can we, how about this idea for sure? Just, you know, and next week it's on like jewel saver coupons to email blast. Uh, I mean, whatever it is, it's, it's moments before it's handled. Yeah. That's, that's nice. You can just get it done. So tell us, Chris, are you, what kind of leader, how would you describe yourself as a leader? Yes. So I guess I, I don't know the words demanding. I have high expectations for everybody that works for the automotive group, but in regards, I want them to have high expectations for themselves. Um, and I would never ask them to do something that uh, I personally would not do. So I coach the managers to, you know, drive customers cars, get as much information as you can at right up from the gas, maybe drive with them, drive after with them, you know, especially on cars now are difficult to repair. Not everything's simple, you know, as they were in the past. There's so many noises or performance issues or different transmissions and hybrids and the car is turning off and it should not turn off or it turns off and they think it should run. So I really teach everybody to be hands-on and have empathy for the guest and listen and learn and they come to an understanding how we're going to get this car um, fixed for them or having them an understanding of how their car is meant to run. So everything, I guess I coach is, you know, hands-on, we're there for the consumer, um, but we're also there to protect their, protect the store and to uh, offer services. So it's, we do um, expect a lot from the advisors and from the managers, but we also, you know, have want a world-class experience. We have to have a, a you know, a high standard for the guests and high, you know, manufacturer scores. So they, you know, you can get both, but you just got to care. Yeah. The experience is really important, right? Uh, the better job we do building value, the less objection there is to price. And they, they don't know. They're coming to you as the, as the expert, right? That's what they're coming to you for. And I know there's a lot of moving components. There's, there's equipment, there's techs, there's advisors, uh, all the different vendors that you use. Uh, and we, we all know that the first point of contact, for the most part, is where all four of your profit centers are located, which is on your website. So that needs to be a good experience, too, uh, mm -hmm. because in, anybody can advertise a price. What, what comes with that? And when you match that, when you get into the service drive, uh, that, that, that starts uh, the things that all of us are dealing with today is repeat referral and retention. Uh, those are your mantras. That's what you live by. That's how, when somebody would ask me or what I, that's what I think, uh, uh, Chris, and that you're, you're hands on. So when you first went in to the Sutherland, did you kind of see what was going on and slowly started implementing? Did you make wide sweeping changes? Some yes, some no, and let a little time go by. And how was that well received? Because they, they didn't have somebody like you before, did they? Yeah, no, I was, it was a um, grassroots kind of job, you know, I was uh, there to build it and establish kind of what it meant to be the VP of the group, to make my own reports, develop processes for all the stores. To be honest with you, one of the first things I did was start to read the ROs. So advisor would write an RO and it would come to me. So I read thousands of ROs. I wanted to see, you know, what we were, what the customer was seeing and what the mechanics were seeing. Because mm -hmm. there's no communication between the two, mm -hmm. you know, then it just slows everything down. So I read so many work orders. And then uh, taught the advisors, you know, like what needs to be worked on, on a work order, you know, develop the process, what I expect. And once the work order is written nice and neat and all the information's there, it's interesting how smoothly everything else can go throughout the day <laughs> when you have everything you need, True. you know, on that work order. So, um, yeah, a lot of it was just reading getting a feel for um, where the, I can make the most improvement with each store. So one of the stores was discounting so heavily because they felt that's what they needed to capture the guests. So after I minimized their discounts, increased their pricing, the store actually grew because there was more value to creating a better process than just giving away the money and providing a, a not so good process. Yeah, so the guests would have thought. <laughs> yeah, the guests, don't care about if, you, if I took two or three hours or you treat me poorly, even though you gave me 10% off or 20% off, that just helped me today. I'm not coming back. You know, discounts don't fix uh, poor service. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to take a moment to say a few words about our new sponsor, WIMS. 
People who love cars love WINS. With over 80 years of experience and innovation, WINS leads the industry with product and system innovations that drive vehicle performance and longevity. WINS leads through our innovation, our technology, and the products we create. We bring a legacy of superior performance that professional service providers trust through our heritage of innovative formulas and unparalleled service. It starts with fuel and oil and it ends with excellence. Our dedication to research and development has led to more than 18,000 granted and pending patents across our company. And that drive continues today at WINS. New vehicle technology like EV requires leading edge service and products. WINS ensures our products meet EV requirements and still provide the same high level of protection that we've always offered. We meet tomorrow's needs by using our knowledge and technology today. WINS brings innovative, technically advanced, professional grade solutions to the world. Our legacy of innovation and performance is always copied, but never outrun. So thank you, Wins, for sponsoring the What the Fix Stops podcast. No, uh, leadership does. Sometimes when I'm talking to people, so I have this, uh, uh, I even forgot the name of it. It's like a minute from here. It's a convenience store. And a gallon of milk is like, you know, $6 a gallon. But Walmart is quite a bit further, right? And it's like uh, $2.95. And I asked people, which one do you think is cheaper? They said, oh, the Walmart. That's the only place we'll go for milk. And I said, you think maybe it really might, could cost you more? I said, how could it cost you more? It's $2.95 versus $6. Well, how long does it take to get there? Where, where, where is the dairy products? And are you really going to walk out of there with just a gallon of milk after you go through the entire store? And then by the time you get out there, a cart is dinged your door and then you're home and it's 45 minutes later for a gallon of milk that you thought you were going to spend 295 for and you spent a hundred dollars and you got a ding on your car the gas wear and tear in your time isn't it cheaper to just get the six i mean so it's about value the, the the convenience of something like that is worth more to me and that's what i get when i go to my local dealer is i want i i don't mind paying i don't mind paying i don't think most customers mind paying more if the experience and the values there, do you agree? Yeah, it just has to be true empathy and true appreciation for them to all the, the, what they've earned throughout that month or year to come spend it with you. You need to treat that with respect, you know, not just take it for granted that they chose you that day. But we, I mean, we do a phenomenal job, but I always tell everybody like, let's, we do celebrate the rewards, but then it's like, what did we miss? last month or what did we miss the month before? What can we do better? You know, so I can, I remember in Charleston, you know, I just taken the store to the top, you know, three in the United States. And my express team was like, to me, one of the best, we were doing like $700,000 in fixed gross from the small little store. And then one day a customer came back and they had like, like an oil leak, uh, like an oil leak concern, but it was just never service. We did tires and brakes and everything. And, uh, I take the car to the main shop and pop the hood and the valve cover is leaking. I'm like, I was shocked. I was like, in my store, they were just here. <laughs> they just bought brakes and tires. I was like, it blew my mind that we could be doing so well and things are so smooth, but yeah, we totally just missed this opportunity and kind of failed the gas. So obviously I paid for the valve cover, wow. but then it was really eye waking. Like, oh my, like you can do so well. You know, just because you made a lot of money doesn't, doesn't mean you did a good job. Because what did you miss? So we're always talking about like, what did we miss? What can we do better? And, you know, we've changed some of the inspection processes now to hopefully, you know, stopping from the like happening where we have a supervisor or a lead tech, you know, near the express team. But that day just, like blew my mind. I was like, man, I love these guys. <laughs> it's like they failed me. And then, you know, there wasn't even my car, but I felt like, wow. I wonder what else that we could have missed. And we we're so good. It was just wild. Did you start looking to see what else they missed? Well, moving forward, we changed the process. So yeah, we implemented <laughs> before the hood was able to close, that someone had to come over then inspect the vehicle, and then they were to close the hood and move on. But yeah, it was just if that would never have happened, I mean, we could have been doing so well but yet so poor, and I wouldn't even known. 
that's an experience. Uh, you just exceeded that customer's expectations because you paid for that yourself, didn't you? Well, of course. Yeah. And I was embarrassed. <laughs> you do tires and brakes, but you know, they leave with an oil leak. Yeah. I think people really do want to be led. Uh, they want to know they count, they matter. And you do a good job of that. The empathy is really important in dealing with people, uh, all, all of your people, as well as the customers. And they want to, they, they just want somebody to listen to them. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Indeed. It's, it's really amazing business. The, the customers are wonderful. There's a few that, you know, obviously are not as wonderful, but in, in general, I mean, well, I'll, there's thousands of customers that come to our group and there's so many good stories from the suit, especially the Subaru guests. Those advisors are constantly getting emails and thank yous and little caveats and donuts and things like that. So it's a, it's a pretty amazing that you can provide such a service that the consumer will spend some money with you, but feel so good to provide you with some sort of gift for making sure they're safe. I love it. And if you can build that relationship with all your guests individually as an advisor, where they treat you more as a friend than just someone to come to do business with than you've won in our industry. I like to ask our guests that come on um, this question, probably for about the same reason that you like talking to all of your uh, customers that come in. But I, I would say that it's fair to say that you've gotten to the next level in your automotive career. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you, how did you do it? How do you, what do you attribute that success to? Or is it multiple things? It's a big question. Yeah. So I think learning um, and replicating success. Um, you know, so like, you know, I mentioned, you know, Michael Barrick, but, you know, when I saw his store beating me and how did I do it? There's been other, you know, just like there's Jason Yates. There's so many people in our industry that as, if you're a young advisor, a young manager in the group, you know, you learn, implement. And then you do have to kind of, let's say market yourself, but, you know, network yourself when you go to meetings or when you go to these workshops, you get to know the people that are in our industry. My career path came from word of mouth. So I would learn, 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 implement, 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 grow my staff, promote, promote, promote. Then, you know, I still get calls from technicians that I worked with 10 years ago saying thank wow. you or the service <laughs> advisor that, um, you know, that I had promoted from the, the parts department saying I've changed this life forever. Be so thankful. So wow, everything that I've done in my career, I've tried to share it with everybody. And then I've tried to learn from everybody else so that I can become better. And then also broaden who I know in the industry so that if I do need a job or I do want to make a move, then I have good references. They're like, yes, you know, you can trust in Chris. So if you don't network yourself. Don't do what you need to do every day. Don't get outside of um, your bubble where you work. Then I think you're kind of, um, you'll trap yourself in your career. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Cause you only know what you know. You definitely have to keep learning and, and meeting people, obviously like an opportunity like this today, or, if, you know, meeting Russell those years ago um, and seeing what his website can do to our store. And then, you know, just, being able to learn. So I've noticed from when I've asked that question before, a, a lot of successful fixed ops guys, they, they leave the door open to, you know, vendors, for example, that want to come in and show you their product or something. They'll, they'll sit down and listen to see what it's all about. They're really open minded. Yeah. Well, so Repair Pal, I think, I don't know if anybody, we had Repair Pal in Charleston, but we ended up terminating our contract with them. So then when I came to take on the stores in uh, Florida, where are Sutherland now, I knew that they had a good product, but some of the, some of the options back then weren't the, what Hudson wanted. So I called them back, brought them down. They're like, oh yeah, Chris, we can do that for you. No problem, we'll work with you. And so now RepairPal, I would have, is in all of our stores. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's sometimes not always even the first attempt at a business relationship, but it's working out the needs for your store. And then next thing you know, it just blossoms into like a true, you know, friendship slash, I guess, business advocate for you. Because what some would, um, what RepairPal does for our store, 
just the confidence to be able to quote a price or the BDC to look something up, be able to quote a price is uh, truly amazing. It is very transparent. There, yeah. there are sponsors as well. Just to okay. put that out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, when, so when we set up a store, it's um, your company, Fix Ops Marketing, Repair Pal, Dealer Wing, and Sunbit. Uh, those are the four vendors I take with me everywhere I go. Uh, and Wins. Store. Don't forget about Wins. Oh, and Wins. Sorry, Wins. Sorry, uh, Jesse. No, also kidding. a sponsor of ours. <laughs> yeah. So and Wins, Wins is in all of our stores also. And that's so Wins relationship um last year you know we had the hurricane um down here in um florida so we were without power and all sorts of crazy things for people we had employees that were homeless and no electricity so winds came for like a full day and brought water and cooked for like everybody like wow. customers technicians employees it was and wow. all day they're beat but i was like wow I mean, and that I don't think they just did it for us. They did it for other stores that had the same scenario that they involved in. So they, it was just amazing the support that we got from them. Also, that's the kind of stuff we need to hear from people uh, about about vendors. Uh, so, in in your position, you how does a vendor even get to you, and how do you even pick and choose? who you actually get to spend time with because you could theoretically spend every day, all day visiting with vendors. So how, how, how does one make the cut? I'm just curious. So lots of times that, you know, it is a, if it's a need that the store needs. It is a long process because we're, we are, um, I guess like educating, I'm educating myself on, you know, who's using your product, what the product does. Will my staff actually be able to use your product? Because if I spend all this money and no one's using it, then it's a waste of money. Um, recently, we, we are using call stores for two of our stores, which is outside BDC. And that took like three or four Zoom meetings, me Zoom meeting other you know, companies also. And we decided to go with, um, with them. But once again, I think it's all, at the end of the day, it's, it's where I feel I'm going to get the best immediate support for our store. So if something happens and I need it fixed, who can, what's, who can I count on to get Absolutely. it fixed in a timely manner? With you and I with Alexa store, Alexa's like, oh, no, no, like you can't have this. We're like, well, it's new to us. We have it on Oliver, you know? So like, I think the next day, like it was fixed, you know? So we were Alexa's compliant. It wasn't like a week later. It's like next day, everything was, you know, compliant on the Alexa's website for our, our group. Yeah, um, I didn't even I didn't even know if you knew that if you're in the loop on on uh, what was going on with the fonts and stuff like that. But apparently you were so good. Yeah, I think Chris is involved in everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is also what I like to ask because I uh, there are different perspectives depending on where you are and what's going on right now. And it kind of is interesting to see a change over time. What do you think dealerships are struggling the most with right now? I feel like new car, new car sales, I think are trending in a downward direction. Um, so in my line of work on the fixed side, uh, less new car sales is, is bad for our business, right? Because you sell a car, we get a customer, you sell another car, we get another customer. So the less new cars that are sold, um, it can affect, uh, our business. Um, so that's like a long-term possible effect. The new cars continue to, to, to fall off, but I guess obviously there's always technician shortages, getting the uh, younger techs to share the vision of becoming, you know, I mean, shop tech one day and, you know, creating this plan for them. I have not seen in the group and then also my other group, like a, a lot of 10 year techs at the same store. It seems like express techs are moving a lot. So main shop techs are moving. It seems like there's been lots of movement and with uh, the techs in the automotive world. And then in certain markets, the techs are making flat rate, like some crazy money. So you can see it's a desperate time for, for those, uh, for those techs. So between like the new car sales, possibly like decreasing and the technicians, you just have to be very, very um, rewarding, very, I guess, uh, attentive to the needs of the technicians, um, be aware. And then on the new car side, 
it's very important that we retain our service customers and keep those coming back just yeah. in case we don't have as many new cars sold. So it's a, a game for us right now is retaining as many guests as we can, hopefully moving to retaining all the guests that we sold, even like a non make sure. car. And then making sure that technicians have everything they need to be successful and that they feel that they are part of the team. Now, do you think there is a tax shortage going on or do you think um, on the flip side of that, maybe dealerships are just having a hard time attracting certain age groups or uh, generations? I'm not a technician, right? So I'm not sure what, how they see you know, what's going on. But um, for me being in the business so long, I do see um, the cars are getting more difficult to work on. The manufacturer is paying less flat rate hours to these techs. Um, you know, many times they'll spend hours on them and get pennies. So sometimes there's no value to them to even work on a car that's in the manufacturing warranty. Um, so then you really have to have a, people are focused then on the customer pay and how to gain more of that. So do we have a tech shortage or are they just getting paid less and the cars are harder to, to work on from when we had distributor caps and built filters and, you know, you just check the timing with the timing light and the cars are good to go. I mean, the car is so advanced now. Are they really getting paid for their time or are they wasting their time on all these cars? And is that why we have this inefficiency or it's, it's you know, it'd, it'd be interesting to have a panel of those gentlemen to see yeah. their tech shortage or are they really getting the blend in the stick right now? in this, you know, world Good with point. these type of cars. Yeah, I'll make a note of that one. Yeah, that's a great point. Patrick's already making a note of that one. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that really is a great point. I wonder sometimes, I hear about um, technicians leaving over a couple, a few dollars an hour or something like that. Is it really about the money or is it more about uh, the leadership and they don't feel valued uh, or inspired or motivated? Or is it a combination of both? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's a little bit of both. I think they're looking at like they have a value that they feel they're worth for their skill set. Um, and then the dealership has a, a margin they're trying to maintain uh, and then not charge the guest a super high margin to maintain that margin. So there's just this blend of I'm valued at this, you know, the store needs X and then, you know, the consumer is going to pay X. So you just try to keep that pendulum, you know, balanced so you can make everybody, um, happy but i do um the market that we were in in uh, georgia i mean it was it was rough a lot a lot of tech hopping you know in that area four five dollars more four dollars more you know per flat rate hour so makes a difference doesn't it yeah so how about this let's pivot here for a second are you married and have children and what are their names and how old and what's your what's your wife's name if you're married yeah, so I'm married. My wife's name is Monse. Um, so I have two children, um, and then she has two children. So it's collectively, there's four. Uh, mine are living in Southern California, and hers are living in Ecuador. The oldest ones are 27, and then my youngest is 19, and there's a 20-year-old also. Wow. You said yeah. Ecuador? Yes. You ever go visit? Um, I have visited when we got married a few years ago, but I've not been back since. So, and how did you guys meet? He was here visiting family in Florida when I lived in, uh, on the other coast. It's amazing how things work, huh? Yes. Yeah. I've seen you guys on pictures on uh, Facebook on a uh, uh, beautiful wife, uh, uh, pictures on uh, trips and stuff that you take and you don't get to take a lot of those right now, do you? Most of them are work trips. And then we, you know, uh -huh. in the evenings, try to do something besides, uh, you know, work all day long. True. So I'm going to ask you this as well. Uh, as you're um, growing up and uh, working in different aspects of automotive, because you've been in the automotive space for a long time, was there a defining moment where you said, hey, either I want to do this and continue to learn, or I don't want to do this anymore? Was there any kind of crossroads where, where the light went off and you dug in and uh, who, who mentored you? Where did your inspiration come from to keep moving and keep learning? Because it is really important uh, to continue to grow. And that's very important, like who you associate with and things you read and people you listen to. 
Where did that come from? Because nobody gets VP of an auto, Sutherland Automotive Group unless they have a, a lot of passion and desire uh, in a lot of different areas. Where did that come from, Chris? So originally it came from my father. My father was a, a owner of an Acura and a Subaru franchise um, while I was growing up. So him providing for the family in such a manner inspired me to want to be able to be like a provider and use this automotive as a vessel for me to provide for my family and to accomplish the goals that I wanted in life. But one of the first, I guess, moments where I knew this was the career for me is there's a gentleman um, spoke Spanish mainly. He was a porter, but the best guy in the world. So I thought he would make a very good advisor, but obviously very little English at the time in his career. So I can remember on a white piece of paper, I wrote down like the words, you know, customer safe, my check engine light is on. Customer safe, my brakes make noise. That way he could actually write that on the RO, you know, because he didn't know the English that well. So we have to, a year, two years, he was speaking English. He was typing English. He was wow. so good. He was able to buy a home. Nice. Like, so I'm like, wow, this young man who was washing cars barely knew English within two years of his skill and my guidance, he was able to accomplish this dream of his. So I was like, so this is pretty awesome because I've been able to accomplish my dreams at that point in my career. But then I was able to, uh, I have someone else to accomplish their dreams. So then it was kind of my point to make sure that everybody that I had touched um, that worked with me I somehow was able to help them reach a, a goal, whether that was to become a master tech, express tech, service advisor, buy a home, whatever that was, that I would help them accomplish those goals by providing a great place for them to work, learn, and make a, a good living. And that was when I was probably in my mid-20s. <laughs> and you've been doing it ever since. Yeah. I really... Uh... Uh, ascribe to that. I call it the Zig Ziglar philosophy because that's where I learned it. Of course, for many years, I wasn't that way. I was very selfish, self-seeking, and self-centered. But I realized um, the more people I help, particularly when I get into a funk or down, when I reach out to people and get outside of myself, uh, I, I, I always look for ways to elevate. I don't care if it's opening a door, making a comment, uh, finding out what's important to them. But that stuff builds a lot of passion inside of me uh, by, by helping other people get what they want. And I can't, even though I really think that it's all attributed, you know, you know you, biblical, right? It's better to give than to receive, et cetera. That stuff comes back to you. You can't really quantify it and say, well, this happened because I helped this person or that person or that. But that, that's what gives us um, uh, a fulfillment, I think. And if I'm hearing you, it is for you too. That's where... The, that is the thing about Crystal Phillips that I think that all your people would say, now, does everybody get that from you? Now, there's some people that just want to get on and do this and do that or see how long you're going to last or whatever the case may be. But you're on the drive for eight hours talking to customers and working with the advisor. I don't know anybody in your position does that. I'm not saying they're not out there. I just don't know anybody that's in that position. That's how, mm. you, that's how you get respect right there, right? Yeah, it's just so there's so many stories where, you know, um, the young lady in the BDC, you know, yeah, tell us about it. Week twice looking to be an advisor, finally gave her the opportunity. And I can remember one month she was like the lead advisor in the group. Wow. So it's, you know, and same thing, she was able to then get her own place. It's just the automotive um, industry has so many great people. And if the managers really invest some time and listen and take chances on, on um, people, I mean, it's, it's crazy what what this what it can do for you. So let me ask you about that uh, BDC lady. Uh, over a period of time, I guess if I heard you correctly, she was asking you or wanted to or what 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 why were you why were you talking to the, one of the BDC people? They were looking for an opportunity and they weren't getting any kind of um, I guess response from the current manager at the time. And you were you were listening. Did that it and 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 as she spoke to you and find out, I guess you shared with her what it was about, and then finally 
she was persistent enough that you said, yeah, let, let's, let's do this. And it obviously worked out, right? Yeah. Cause anybody I feel that would have like a BDC rep that would approach me at that time, I was also the director of uh, five rooftops to, you know, approach me with such confidence that she could do the job and she wants it so bad. I was like, well, like, I yeah. guess you do. Yeah. Who <laughs> cares about the experience if they got that kind of passion, right? right. I was like, <laughs> You know, if you could sell me on why do you think you need that job, then Come on, you can sell a customer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why they need to get their car serviced, you know, at the dealership. Those are the stories that define us and make us, I believe, is the people we surround ourselves with. And I, I think it's really important. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing that. I, I have, uh, I'm sure you have similar stories where you have and you got bit, but, you know, it's okay. Love them where they're at and move on down the road. Maybe they got something out of it later on. Uh, uh, because of what you instilled in him or her that later on, and I'm sure like you, you'd mentioned earlier, you talked to a, a technician that you've known for 10 years, right? They still oh, yeah. call you and you inspired and motivated them to achieve and, and reach for more. Sometimes that's all people need. Somebody just to believe in them, right? There's now you get the messages like, man, if McPhillips was still here, things would be different, you know, comments like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably true. I'm like, oh, yeah. No, we, won't, we, won't, we won't mention any stores or, you know, anyway. yeah, right. No, of course not. No. But, you know, th things like that is just wild because it's just respect for them and, and listening to them. Is what they is what they're really wanting. Sounds simple. So you know that that brings a thought into my head. There, I, I don't hear many stories of people, you know, going into like a department store and being able to work their way up and and buy a house or, you know, I I really only hear about automotive and, you know, what is it that makes automotive special in that way? The revenue that is generated from the automobile industry um, since it's a selling opportunity provides a higher source of income than selling potentially you know something inside of a domestic like a store department store you know like shoes or colognes or something like that the the monies that these stores can generate can afford to pay someone with a high skill set you know a very good wage um and i was talking to uh when i was interviewing some of the service advisors last week that are new to our group that's what i asked them like did you go to high school to be service advisor or i mean there's no courses right mm -hmm. like in college like service advisor 101 you know <laughs> All right. there's a book <laughs> i want to be a service advisor like half of us don't even know what the position's called you know you just go in and get your car service and someone comes out and helps me i don't know what they're called so it's just interesting, like the, you know, how they be, you know, one person was a cashier to begin with, or this person was doing something else, but nobody graduated from high school, from college and says, I'm going to go write service. All right. You know? Nope. They, right. they landed in it because they were good with people. Yep. It, it, it's it is the greatest industry in the planet. I mean, it really is. It, it's, it's, it's vast, but it's really very small. It's uh, welcoming. In 1985, I, I was uh, I wanted to do something different in my life, and I wanted to sell cars. I became infatuated in 1968 when I got my first Hot Wheel when Hot Wheels came out, and I, I fell in love with cars ever since. And so I wanted to sell cars. I had no idea what I didn't have. You know, I didn't know that if you just had a passion and desire, and you're willing to listen. This guy, his name is Mike Bigger, still still a friend of mine today. We don't talk as much as we used to. But he yeah. took me under his arm and trained me. And I ended up making more than people coming out of college with a four-year degree. And the, the irony is I don't even like cars. Like, I like people. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. it's, it's, you know, like when I was at my father, had bought me a 67 Camaro and then a 69. Him and I were supposed to rebuild it together. And that was going to be my car. And we were going to work on it at night in the garage after a few months of me. In the cold garage on the floor, yeah. working on this car with my father, I'm like, I'm not for cars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'd rather go talk to like ten people. <laughs> well, you're, then, uh, you're good at that, man. You are. Yes, yeah, you it, are. It, it's wonderful. Not only that, but if somebody like that 
young woman that you were mentioning earlier that just, you know, you, you gave her a shot. It just depends on where you want to go. But I know some technicians, particularly with Highline, they're making over $200,000. They're certified, you know, masters. But I mean, they make over $200,000 a year. But they didn't start that way uh, when they first got there. And most of the time through their career development, the dealership would end up actually paying for their education to keep going to the next level. And, and I know we're, we're, the market or the industry is changing, but it, you have to put in the time. And I mean, like, time. So the majority of my career was like 10, 11 hour days, you know, yeah. five to six days a week. And I know the industry is trying to change that and evolve in these four day work weeks. But I, I remember when I first was in service, it was like 7.30 to 5.30, no Saturdays, you know? And then one day, the independents were, you know, kicking our butts and like, we're going to open on Saturday till noon. And nobody asked for a day off. They're like, we well, guess we're open on Saturday till noon now, everybody. Like, and everybody just worked Monday through Friday and Saturday till noon. It was. It. Yeah. it was like, we're open on Saturdays now. It, it was wild, you know? And, and now, some of the stores I go to that we own, when we took them over, they're like, they treat us Saturday like they should be closed. And to me, it was like, wild. I'm like, we're open, but you only have like three people here. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's, and to me, I was telling them, I'm like, it's so disrespectful. Like, go to the theater on a Saturday and then walk in, and the person getting your ticket and the person making that popcorn, and the person running the movie is the same person, and you gotta wait 30 extra minutes. I'm like, would you like that? And they're like, <laughs> Well, I just don't like it working stars. I'm like, the people in <laughs> the theaters don't either, but they're there for you. They're <laughs> open. So it's this whole culture change to quit the employees, to quit thinking about themselves and realize, hey, we're in a customer focused business. So if we're open, like we're open, let's go. Put the yeah. smile on, get staff, let's run. Like we're open. So the Saturdays, you know, kind of um, amaze me that people that work then still feel like, ugh, I don't want to work a Saturday. Like, you want to go somewhere else and get service on a Saturday, but you don't ever buy the same service? What yeah. is your opportunity? Good point. <laughs> Good point. It's just, yeah, it's wild the mentality or like, you know, the technology where everybody's going digital and these, oh, I'm going to go with technology. Well, quit using online banking, please. And don't pay any bills online from them. I want you to go to the bank every time you need to do everything. Don't use your phone anymore. Well, no. Well, then. Start using a tablet. <laughs> this is, I know, if you can use online banking, you're going to use the tablet at some automotive. So get that, used to it. That's very simple too. That was a great analogy. Yeah. People yeah. don't like change, do they? Yeah. But yet they're using it. I know. But yet they don't <laughs> want to provide the same service because yeah. you know, I, they don't I like, like technology. Yeah. I like that theater thing. Uh, you, you buy a ticket and then, uh, then you walk in there and they serve you popcorn and cook, same person. Then they go take your ticket from you and tell you where the theater's at. And I mean, it's just like, are you kidding me? Uh, you're right. If you're, if you're staff, take care of the customer, right? Yeah, let's go. We are passionate about helping consumers find a great, trusted place to get their car fixed. We have 4 million uniques who come to our website each month for car repair information. And we help them find our RepairPal certified locations. We also have amazing partners like USAA that offer our RepairPal certified network to their customers and members. So how are we gonna help dealers? Well, dealers sell 100% of the cars, but over time, after the warranty expires, the repairs go up and up and the revenue potential goes up, but people keep leaving the dealer over time after the warranty. By years 10 or 12, only about 20% of people are still servicing at the dealer. Why is that? There's one dominant reason, and that is price perception. And being RepairPal certified helps you overcome the primary price perception problem. So come let us show you how RepairPal can help you too. We're open. Let's give that wow experience on a Saturday. And, you know, the next Saturday you're off, then you go, you know, somewhere and hopefully you get a great experience because they don't want to be there, but they still know they have to be there <laughs> to take care of you. That, that I'm sure over the last almost year, and once again, it, I, I don't think it's really just speculation because as I've gotten to know you, a lot of people got a lot out of you coming aboard and uh, being in the stores and doing the things and being in the trenches and working the hours and doing what it takes. And it's all about the customer. 
everything is about the customer, right? Everything is about the customer. And if it's, and then the moment's not about the customer, it's about your employee. So every, all throughout <laughs> the day, you're like, great job, you know, thank you. Like, you know, making sure that they know we see them and appreciate them for taking care of the customer, right? So then it's just back and forth, you know, thanking the staff for taking care of the guests, thanking the guests for choosing the service with you, and then making sure everybody understands that, you know, through that, anything, we're here for everybody. Well, Chris, I'm going to ask you kind of an off the wall kind of question for our last right. question. No, don't do it, Jerry. Don't I'm do gonna it. I'm going to do it. I'm okay, going to do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us something that, and you can take this for whatever direction you want. Tell mm -hmm. us something that terrifies you. I guess the moment that like deeply, maybe the moment that I can't provide for my uh, family, you know, maybe something were to happen to me and I couldn't provide for my family. I think that would terrify me the most just because, because my father was such the greatest provider for our family for, you know, up until even today, he just turned 80, you know, he's always taking care of the family. So my purpose in life per se is to take care of my family. So the moment I couldn't do that, I think, I don't know how I, you know, what I would do. And then the second silly thing would be like falling off the ladder, hanging up Christmas lights. But there's so many <laughs> friends. <laughs> With a broken wrist or something. How did you do that? By hanging Christmas lights. I love so, that. So I'm like, I'm getting a single story home. I'm not on any ladders. <laughs> hanging Christmas lights to break my wrist. So that, that was amazing. I, uh, uh, a week and a half ago, we were with the whole family flew up to Pennsylvania for a lot of different reasons. One of them was a baptism. Well, we went to this water park place called Kalahari. Uh, it's an amazing indoor water park. Okay and all the kids, all the grandkids, et cetera. And so the oldest granddaughter wanted me to go on one of these huge slides, okay? I mean, this thing was like huge. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, Papa can handle that. And I got up there and I gotta tell you what, um, I, I can't do that anymore. I'm not riding those rides anymore. I threw my arm out doing something, grabbing something wrong. And, and uh, I just, it's like, um, I'm afraid of those types of things incapacitating me in some way that I can't do what I need to do. I, I think uh, I, I have a, a similar type fear where, or they say, Oh, Papa, you're too old. I'll do that for you. And I say, get out of the way. I can lift that thing. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah I, I wouldn't want to be out, out of commission because I fell off a ladder hanging Christmas lights. Although I've known it to happen to a couple of people. I know it's the, <laughs> it's the craziest story. Yeah. Yeah. Through. It's dangerous work. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. All the for Santa. <laughs> well, Chris, normally uh, we're we're getting close to the end. We got a couple of minutes, um, and we 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 want to give you uh, a couple of minutes to say whatever you'd like to say to the audience. A lot of them know you, or, or they, they know of you. Hopefully they'll take this opportunity as well as from Fix Ops Institute to get to know you a little bit more about what makes you tick and drive. But what would you, you can say whatever you want. Uh, how, can people get a hold of you uh, for mentorship, you know, to tap on you to ask you this, this or that? How does someone get a hold of you? And what would you like to say to our audience? Four is yours. I mean, I, I try to do my best to respond to you know, on LinkedIn or any kind of text messaging. Um, maybe like six months ago, I wrote a business plan for a manager that I knew very well that was trying or an advisor was trying to become a manager. So I wrote him a business plan for his interview. Um, but I, I guess LinkedIn or social media, and of course, you know, give advice or, you know, tell you what works for me, um, what works at our stores. Um, might not work for your store. Maybe you have a humongous board store doing 5,000 ROs and you are digital and you can't look at every RO. You know, our stores are doing the most like 2,000 CP tickets plus warranty or less. So I feel at that time, it's humanly possible to read every single RO. Um, but if I guess the biggest thing is, is seeing what your customer sees. You know, so if you're a current manager or advisor, like, would you want to go through your service department? Like, how do you, do you see it the same way they see it? You know, the whole write-up process or what goes on RO or how you spoke to me or how you followed up, is that how you would want to get service? So if you're not answering that question, yes, then maybe there's opportunity to 
smile, or change, or be more open to um, what's the changing environment of, you know, of the, the cars, the technology, the expectation, technology, pricing, I mean, whatever it is, just try to be the consumer and then try to pretend you're servicing yourself as you're talking to the consumer, you know, that you'd want to do business with yourself. Great advice. Great yeah. advice. If, if there was, um, if, if certain people were led and inspired or maybe they're in between and they're, uh, uh, they're looking or they're moving and, and they wanted an opportunity to uh, work under somebody like you, are, mm -hmm. are you, are you hiring? We're, um, we're hiring service advisors. Then um, this year, I believe that we're, um, we are working on acquiring more stores. So there'll be, um, this year, there should be tons of opportunities for people, but we currently are um, hiring. So, yes. Good. Thank you very much. Charity, any other last thoughts? I don't think so. I, you know, great conversation. It sounds like your dad really instilled a lot of really positive values in you that trickle in through your family and your career. And um, I, I can just see the next several years are going to be great. Yeah, they yes, are. Thank you. For sure. So I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. And I'm going to encourage you uh, to listen to these shorts that come out. Uh, I don't know exactly when they're coming out, but you'll, you'll notify because Charity uh, does a great job of letting people know when episodes are rolling out. But I can tell you this, uh, like them, love them, share them, find, a, a, find our stuff, check them out on LinkedIn. Reach out to him if you, if there's something he can help you with. I know, he, you know if he got flooded with a thousand people, uh, that would be great. I don't know if that would happen, but I can tell you this. Chris McPhillips, you are truly an amazing man and giver back to community. And so thank you very much for coming on WTF today. We really appreciate you. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris.